Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. G'day, welcome to the Australian Property Podcast, our weekly two cents segment. I'm Pete Wargent from Alan Wargent Property Buyers and I'm joined by Chris Bates. Christopher, how are we? Life's good, Pete. Doing well. How's um, how's things on the sunny coast? I was obviously up there last week uh, at the AFG, uh, you know, Strategic Partners Conference, which is all the top practices at AFG, one of the big mortgage aggregators. Um, yeah, did a beautiful walk up around the headland and the National Park there to Hell's Gate in the morning and, um, yeah, went for a swim. It's um, such a beautiful spot. How's things up there? Pretty good, yeah. It's, um, weather's been a bit temperamental, hasn't it? So we've had uh, it's absolutely been bucketing it down overnight. Some of the daytime's been okay, but it's been up and down, and we've just been really busy. Like uh, we've put in the past, where are we? We're recording this on Tuesday. We've put six properties under contract this week, which uh, and it's only Tuesday, but I mean that makes it sound like we're a huge operation with loads of. Uh, buyers, agents, and so on. That's not the case. It's just um, sometimes the way things go. Like a lot of stuff comes to a head and then suddenly bang, 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 everything comes together. But we, we've also had long periods where it's been very difficult to get stuff bought as well. So it's been uh, gratifying just to get some properties under contract because it's been a challenging buying environment, um, especially in Brisbane this year, a bit less so in New South Wales, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. We've seen um, some really strong appetite by our clients that are doing quite well from an income point of view. Um, and they're sort of saying, well, actually, I do need to upgrade. Or yeah, And now is actually, I don't want to do this in six, 12 months time because I'm worried that rate cuts are going to happen and I'm going to miss the boat. Um, or they're, they're thinking, hang on a sec, I've got low debt and I've got great income. Uh, I can still borrow a significant amount and I can still get a good asset. So you know, they, they were a lot of the, those, buy, those uh, buyers were sitting on the sidelines, I'd say, for the last couple of years. But I definitely think they've been coming back in the last few weeks in particular. Um, I can think of a number of our clients that have been, they bought their first property with us, you know, three, four years ago. Now their incomes have shot up for some reason. And now they're like, actually, no, I, I, this was never my forever home. M- makes sense for me to bring my upgrade forward. I thought I might do it in five to seven years, but maybe I'm going to do it in three or four. And um, that's interesting. I think the the first home buyers are always there, and they're always and you know. But when you get the upgraders really wanting to transact, that's you know it's a, it's also a good thing because it brings on more stock onto the market that a lot of first home buyers would want. Um, but then it's also uh, you know that that transactions start to happen more, and I think it. I'm also seeing a lot of the the average stuff that's been on the market start to sell a bit. I don't know if you're starting to see that. Pete as well. Um, auction clearance rates have been surprising everyone. They've been still quite strong, but I think a lot of the the buyers who are missing out on those are then going and buying stuff that aren't the best streets, that aren't the best aspects, um, because obviously there's still a little bit of desperation in the market, and there's still pretty lack of good quality properties on the market. I think what's driving it is we're getting so many people around the same price point. Uh, you know, mm. in Brisbane, it might be eight hundred or a budget of 900 or 1 million. And there's just so, there's, um, the borrowing capacities are well down on where they were a couple of years ago. So it squashed a lot of people into very similar price points. And uh, yes, there's a, when you get a, a good quality property, um, we've seen a lot of uh, times when there's been multiple offers and then 10 buyers are going away having missed yeah. out. And then they start thinking, I just want to get something bought. Uh, the rental market is not a place to be at the moment. And um, I think that's what generates a bit of FOMO. I think when people miss out on a property they were really keen on, then they start thinking, right, maybe I need to make a compromise and um, get something bought. But I think that's a, a big part of it. We've got first home buyers, got investors from interstate, um, up in Queensland we do anyway. Um, and just, yeah, a lot of people with very similar uh, sort of budgets and price points and that's just uh, pressurizing uh, that part of the market yeah we're absolutely seeing the buyers willing to you know get out of sydney go to I've got a client trying to right now driving to avoca for example um you know to look at a property and you know that sort of getting looking you know an hour or two away or moving up to brisbane absolutely is on the cards it wasn't there last year uh, i do think that that is you know their options to rent versus and the options to buy 
in Sydney are quite uh, are non-existent for some people. So they think, hang on a sec, I've got to make a, I've got to find a solution here, and I'm I'm willing to make compromises. I'm just going to have to deal with it with work and the return to work, and so. Yeah, absolutely. I think Brisbane's going to benefit as people get pushed out of, you know, Sydney and Melbourne to maybe a lesser extent. It's a funny time, uh, Brisbane. Uh, diverging fortunes in the AFL, I should say. Sydney Swans doing really well this year, but there's all kinds of stuff going on in Queensland. We had uh, local elections just over the past week. Then Brisbane had its by-elections, uh, which was a bit of a swing against uh, Labour. But a lot of plans being made for the Olympics, and within the space of 24 hours, we get a review. And then the government says we're going to ignore the review and we're not going to uh, upgrade the GABA. We're going to uh, look at using a different athletic stadium. And then three hours later on, there's a new plan. I guess what's coming is a change of government, most likely. And there's a, there's a lot of um, it just underscores the difficulty we have with urban planning in Australia. The uh, governments change uh, stripes every so often. There's not much long term thought goes into it. And, uh, Brisbane is a particularly bad case of that. The, the city's not very well thought through and planned sometimes. But, uh, yeah, it's got uh, cost overruns and dithering written all over it, unfortunately. But uh, hopefully they can deliver the goods come 2032. Yeah. So what three stories we're going to do this week, Pete? Obviously, there's um, the migration stories really kicked off in the last week. And, um, yeah, what, what's the three we're doing? Yeah, hasn't it? Yeah, so I thought um, the the immigration thing might um, we we might go past the peak in two thousand and twenty three, and that story might go away. Unfortunately, not because the ABS put out the latest figures. Uh, so we've got arrivals and departures figures now into two thousand and twenty four, and they they actually accelerated and we've got record highs uh, for that time of year. So we'll take a look at what's actually going on there, and possibly what the government might do in response. Uh, second story. A uh, good piece in the uh, live wire markets. I haven't seen those guys uh, down at uh, Customs House Pub for a while, but uh, live wire has done a great job of growing their subscriber base for mainly for uh, investors in equities. And there's a good piece in there um, discussing whether residential property is a subpar way to grow your wealth. It was a two parter, which will uh, take a bit of a deep dive on. I, I think sometimes, you know, people have their biases going in uh, to these. Uh, analyses and it's good just to sort of run some numbers and do a sense check on these things uh, and then thirdly a story uh, which came from pexa uh, one in four properties or more than one in four properties uh, being bought for cash in 2023 in new south wales victoria queensland and then um, the abc and the fin review just um i guess replicated uh, pexa's findings and just uh, highlighted where cash buyers are splurging on home. So it's quite interesting because it's uh, uh, sort of spread around a bit. I guess you can't nail it down to one particular area or property type, but there's a lot of cash buyers out there. Um, and that's actually something we've seen a bit of as well. Um, so should we kick off with this, uh, the population bomb story? It never seems to go away at the moment. I uh, saw a, uh, a piece on ABC News Breakfast this morning, um, and it was uh, the subject title was what Australia can learn from Toronto's housing market, but not a single reference to immigration or population growth, which is, I guess, it's a bit disingenuous if you only look at the supply side of the equation and not the immigration uh, or the, the demand side, I should say. Uh, so the ABS figures, net immigration uh, was plus 55,000 in January, which takes over the year net overseas migration to around about half a million, which is a record high. I think some of that, when you actually look at it, driven by uh, returning Australian expats, uh, but still, these are massive numbers. And uh, I think uh, when we get the official ABS quarterly figures, which are coming up soon, they'll probably show net overseas migration of about half a million for last year. And obviously, that's what's creating the rental pressures. Um, it's creating some negative media and headlines now. I think people are getting pretty pissed off um, with reading about record high immigration when on the ground, people can see the impacts, um, especially in Brisbane, actually. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what the government response is here. I think build to rent is one thing that's going to get a big push. Um, but also, um, yeah, there's probably going to be some more sort of government uh, noises about uh, winding back temporary visas, potentially making it harder for students to come to Australia and things like that. So what do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to go there with the students. I mean, do you think that a lot of the catch-up, Pete, because you track these numbers pretty closely, 
is a lot of filling up our universities again. And, you know, all the students went home potentially through COVID and online um, version of university versus, you know, in person. Do you think that's just filling up our universities again? And it's not so much our, you know, long-term migration that we're getting here and, th and that's more of an issue? It's been a bit of both. So the, you're right, the temporary visa numbers are at record highs. They went through uh, around, well, they're about two and a half million, which is a lot of people when you think about it on temporary visas in the country. Um, but yeah, the permanent and long-term arrivals figures. So there's always people coming and going. So you've got to look at the net on a net basis, but they, that's basically at a record. Now, like a lot of these graphs we've seen over the last four years, basically you had immigration running along at pretty high levels, then it went to zero. And now we're getting the catch up. So I think if you actually smooth the line over 10, 20 years, we'd be back on trend. But it's because we've gone from nothing to a lot in a short space of time. Of course, it's difficult then for uh, markets to respond, particularly the rental market, because most new arrivals to Australia are renters, not buyers. And th that's where the pressures are showing up the most. I mean, there's also issues with infrastructure and traffic, but it's particularly, I think, in the rental market where it's really uh, flashing up. And do you think this will be a big election? We've obviously, we've got the budget um, going to come around fast now, but the, the election is also not that far away, the national issue. Or do you think this is going to be a big issue that we're going to have to debate? And, um, yeah, do you think it's going to be a big how, – how's that going to play out? Oh, probably. I mean, one of the things uh, about – uh, being European, I suppose, coming here, is it? You, you notice that actually the political parties are much closer together than you might think. Uh, we've got a, a kind of a centre-right party in the coalition and the Labour Party is the progressive side of politics. But often when you look at the, the actual uh, policies and how they work in the real world, they're not that far apart. So definitely um, the opposition party will be looking for ways to differentiate themselves. And this is uh, one of the issues. So energy policy will be another. But I think um, there will certainly be some noises about um, cutting the, the intake. I mean, But it's worth remembering, this has really been a bipartisan policy uh, since probably 20 years ago, the early days of the mining boom. We've run record immigration practically ever since, and that's been both sides of politics. So sometimes it's more the rhetoric than the reality that gets uh, changed. But uh, I think it will certainly be debated. And as you said, um, we're only really a year away, uh, just a little bit more potentially uh, mm. from another federal election because they come around pretty quickly in Oz. Yeah, I do think that the pressure for the rental crisis, but also a first home buyer crisis. So I think a lot is going to happen in the budget around helping people, you know, enter the market um, and get out of rental accommodation. And, you know, because that's going to really calm down a lot of the first home buyers getting forced out. But, you know, this cost of living pressure as well and our inflation, et cetera. Do you think that, you know, potentially a bit dangerous for us to be importing so many people right now when inflation is running high. You know, should that be one of the reasons why we should be a little bit? So hang on a sec. I know we could have a lot more migration, but let's just sort of sit on the sidelines a bit more over the next couple of years till we get inflation back in, in the bottle. I think it was it was needed originally because we obviously had staff shortages and labour shortages and things like hospitality and tourism and retail, but that's that's kind of gone now. If you look at uh, recruitment difficulty rates, um, about three quarters of firms were reporting difficulty in hiring at one stage in 2022, but that's really dropped away uh, to about half and it's, it's trending down and down. So I think the labour shortage issue has been resolved uh, by and large, but now we've got different problems. So we've re replaced the labour shortage with a rental shortage. And as you said, I mean, rent is one of the big parts of the inflation numbers. So uh, that in itself won't be helping. Um, it looked at one stage like uh, rental price growth might be slowing down, but it seems to be uh, potentially uh, being quite sticky um, with record low vacancy rates. So, yeah, I mean, it, it does create problems. And also, um, yeah, we've seen some uh, pressures, price pressures elsewhere as well that probably result from just more people. Uh, more demand in the economy. So, yeah, even though um, on a per capita basis, the economy is pretty weak. Obviously, if you pump in, uh, you know, five, six hundred thousand people in a year, it's going to make a big difference, uh, particularly, I guess, on rents. Yeah, absolutely. So I do think it's one of these things that's probably not going to go away. That's part of our makeup as a country. And um, like yourself, Pete, my family migrated here in the 80s and a lot of Australians are that. So 
I think it's shutting the doors. I don't know if that's really something that we're going to see. Um, so going on to this next story, Pete, around, you know, is property really better than other ways to build wealth? I thought this was a really interesting piece. The AFR picked up on it as well. Yeah, so Livewire ran it originally as a two-part piece. So Sebastian Ferrando um, wrote the article and his basic uh, question was, are US shares a better bet than property investment? Because I, I guess the US stock market has delivered basically 10% per annum for, what, 60 years and probably further back, even if you look at those figures before that. And um, I guess like he makes the point that it's different if you're a property developer. You know, you, obviously that involves some risk and it needs uh, time and skills and some sweat. Um, but what he's saying is, is the average sort of property investor who just buys a property, rents it out and holds it, are, are the returns actually as good? And he, he's sort of saying, well, actually, if you strip out some of the costs, um, which often people forget about, you know, they look, they, they often say, like, I bought this place for... 500k and i've sold it for 750 but by the time they strip out things like um, the stamp duty and the holding costs and things like that actually the returns aren't as good sometimes as people think now i'm sometimes a bit skeptical of these articles because they don't necessarily take full advantage or don't fully reflect i suppose how people use leverage in the real world so in plain English, people borrow to buy property and they very often do so for very long periods of time. You can do it in the stock market as well and there's different ways you can do that, but it's much less common. It's actually harder, I guess. So I think the main advantage that residential property has, and I guess you would know this as a mortgage broker, uh, is that people can leverage up their returns, maybe with, say, a 20% deposit, and um, then they're buying a bigger asset base as a result. Yeah, it's an interesting article. I mean, um, I do think this is the, like you said, people have got preconceived ideas. Um, you know, you've got to be a bit careful with the financial advice world and being anti-property. Um, the reality is that they don't make money on recommending property. They get money if they recommend shares, right, to push. Out. And even if they don't charge an assets under management fee, they usually, you're more likely to pay an advisor a bigger ongoing flat fee if they're managing more and more of your assets, right? So there's always a link there. And I do think that's, you know, decades of advisors basically ignoring property, Australia's biggest asset class, you know, it's, it's all-time highs from, you know, in the last couple of weeks, right? And over $10 trillion, it's way bigger than our shares and our commercial property and our superannuation systems. But I don't think a lot of advisors really skill, skill themselves up on what makes a great asset. Why does this property outperform another? And um, even though it is Australia's biggest asset class by a long, long way and everyone's usually biggest assets. So I do think there's a there's a little bit of that in this this story. I think a little bit of playing with the figures that make the numbers better as well. Most people who buy investment properties aren't putting in huge deposits, right? Um, if And sometimes not even a deposit at all. And this completely changes the number when you um, you put in how much deposit because that changes your leverage and how much um, the returns will change dramatically. And so the articles, uh, the presence of the article was, um, you know, you're putting in a decent deposit. I think he said 35%. Well, most people buying investment properties are leveraging off their home. Um, and, you know, if they're structuring it the right way, they're not putting any deposit in there. They're borrowing the full 20% plus stamp duty um, against their home, and then they're borrowing 80% against the property. So they're borrowing 105% of the property. And all they're really putting into this is their borrowing capacity, but which isn't money, it's access to money, um, they're putting in their negative cash flows and those negative cash flows are getting the gains on the property and that's just not what this comparison did. The other option is, is when a lot of investors um, aren't leveraging against their home but they're leveraging against other investment properties, so that's a very similar story, or they're first-time investors and they haven't bought a home yet um, and usually they haven't got a 35% deposit. Um, and so they're usually putting in a 10% deposit, et cetera, um, because they're trying to leverage their wealth. And so I, I would just say that's the, the, the first issue. Secondly, um, you know, you've got to then uh, analyze individual properties. And, you know, in the article, he used a few anecdotal stories, right? This property or that property, and they support his story, but that doesn't mean that the whole market's performing based on those few properties, you know? Um, and, you know, it depends on where in the cycle um, you do the numbers and what period, et cetera. And so I did think the article, uh, you know, basically just served the interest of what he wanted to get away as, as someone who looks at it more 
subjectively, I would say there's a few issues there with how he did his research. Um, and, you know, but I do think that the context of this discussion is really important. So, you know, it's not property or nothing, right? There's often other asset classes that you really need to consider. And, you know, is it worthwhile if, you know, sometimes people are uh, very uh, cashed up, they've got huge equity in their home and the amount they can put into shares versus the amount they can put into property is very similar because they're going to use equity. And this is when we've got to be really careful, particularly people in their, you know, late 40s and 50s to say, hang on a sec, should you be putting that into property or should you put that into shares? Because there's a lot of benefits to shares over property, you know, liquidity, um, the ability to sell it down in stages, the ability to sell it fast, um, you know, not having to worry about big sunk costs and maintenance, um, and uh, yeah, and, and a, bunch of, a bunch of other things. You can be much more diversified. You can go uh, internationally. Um, you can hedge the exchange rate. So there's there's lots of things that you can consider that shares are better than property. Um, but I guess the, the the idea behind this article was just saying, oh, you know, residential property doesn't outperform uh, U.S. shares. You should just buy U.S. shares. I think that's just a little bit too far fetched when a lot of the people buying residential property aren't leveraging based on his numbers. Yeah, true. I think it's a really good point. Is on liquidity, and particularly if you buy a poor asset, you can't sell. You can't sell a bedroom. You can't sell the bathroom. You, you're basically disposing of it. Sometimes at a loss. And I think it does underscore if you're making fewer decisions in property, it's pretty important that the ones you do make are good investments. On, on this uh, context, I was quite interested to see on um, Eric Wu's uh, Facebook page, Property Talk Australia, uh, yesterday. Uh, just someone threw up one of those old uh, newspaper clippings. Uh, uh, so some auctions scheduled for Collaroy in April 1922. So basically 102 years ago next month. Uh, two pound deposit required for purchase. And I guess today, like you're a Northern Beaches guy at heart, uh, uh, some of these blocks would be worth around about, let's say, two million Aussie dollars, um, maybe a bit more for some of the better blocks. Now, I guess like over 100 years, we've had high inflation, low inflation, had high interest rates and low interest rates, and some of the blocks are better than others. But when I crunched the numbers and accounted for the change in the currency, it looks to me like compound annual growth of more than 11%. It's less than 12. It's probably somewhere in the middle, 11 and a half or something, which is quite interesting for a few reasons. Firstly, it shows real estate's been a good inflation hedge. Um, so if you look at Australian equities over um, 100 years or so, you get a, quite a similar total return. You know, the geometric returns about six, plus you get your dividends. After inflation, the growth is probably about two. A very, very similar, you know, over 100 years. And um, as Cameron Murray actually pointed out, on last week's podcast, as we get wealthier as a nation, we simply spend more on housing. And I think that's a pretty useful uh, model. And it also explains why uh, the cost of, well, the user cost of real estate goes up, but also why people like it as an inflation hedge. As you said, you can probably leverage the re results five times over. I think where, I mean, even as a CA, this is where I find it hard because, as you said, you, you buy a, an investment property, you get some equity, you can pull some equity and then you can invest again. How do you even model the, the rate of return on these things? It's very difficult to, to map out a 10-year plan and say, this is how much capital I'm going to have to put in. These are the expected returns. It, it's, uh, it becomes quite nebulous uh, quite quickly. Uh, but I guess because you can use leverage through multiple cycles in residential property because of the unique lending conditions, I know loads of people with 5 to 10 million property portfolios far fewer people with stock portfolios of the same size and I, I guess that's the thing like there's you can run a model that will prove anything but it's like the real world you know the behavioral benefits of buying a property that you own for 25 years you know i often say when i do my tax return i just can't believe how long i've owned some of the properties we've had you know 25 years and stuff you know in the stock market i've got no shares that i've owned for that long except for some index funds that you know, we've had a long time but I guess it's um, you've got to sometimes look at, okay, here's the theory, but how does it work in practice? Yeah, and I do think that anchoring or that holding bias um, absolutely is one of the things that supports markets, right? When markets do get, go through a period of uncertainty, everyone runs for the, the fences, right, um, in the stock market, right? That's what causes its volatility, you know? Look at 2008 or 99 and lots of different, you go know, back in cycles, right? Um, 
But property, you know, even in COVID, even though there was huge thoughts of 20, 30% crashes, people didn't just rush and sell their home. So it's the holding buyers for investors that they go, they go, what's well, performed for me over the longer term? I don't want to sell it now and pay capital gains tax. Um, and I'm living in the property from home buyers that, that does give it a bit of a, a, a you know, shock absorber. Um, and I do think investors much uh, and that what creates a great investor is actually holding assets long term. And so I think that's also why uh, people are better to hold property sometimes over shares is that, you know, that com how comfortable they are with volatility is sometimes more comfortable with property and then they hold it through cycles rather than shares. They go, oh, it's just dropped 20%. I need to get out. It's it's a lot of what advisors do is keep people in funds and through the downturns. It's, you know, when you actually should be the busiest as an advisor is, is talking to your clients when there is volatility to making sure they don't rush to exits and put it into cash. Um, the other thing is that, you know, if you, if sometimes people think, oh, I, I either, I'm either a property guy or a shares guy. Well, no, no, no. Like you can actually be both. What you want to be doing is understanding lending and leverage and equity um, and see if you can get the best of both worlds. You know, you can buy property once you've got equity in them. You use that equity to buy shares where sometimes people don't buy property because they just want to be a shares person. Um and they, they, they miss out on all the lending benefits of borrowing against, you know, residential assets, which is much lower rates, you know, versus, and the risks of margin loans, et cetera. And um, I think that's that's something when you, when you do buy property and it do, does go up in value, um, if you were comparing that to, say, buying a couple hundred thousand dollars of shares, well, once that property does go up in value, maybe you can go and buy that couple hundred thousand dollars of shares through equity. Um, and then you've still got the share portfolio, and you've, but you've also got a, a property as well. And so, um, yeah, just be really careful with those type of articles, I would say, um, just because there's usually uh, some numbers there that don't, they might make sense to the article, but I don't know if that's the reality in terms of how people actually go about buying residential property. As you said, you know, both property and shares are good asset classes. And ideally, if you can have both, um, that's probably the best of both worlds. And as the author actually said, Sebastian, in the piece, um, it can often make sense to buy a home because you're avoiding paying rent. Uh, rents typically just go up over the long run and you get capital gain, gain tax free when you sell and you can trade up. And, and, and it's a different equation for developers as well. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts there and I wouldn't uh, be able to really summarize it into an article, but you've got to take it uh, take into account your own situation, your own preferences, your risk tolerance, as you said, I think often people say that their tolerance for volatility is one thing, but then when yeah. the real world <laughs> happens, it's uh, yeah, it's like uh, you know, paper trading is one thing, but uh, when the, when the markets are moving fast in real time, as we saw in two thousand and twenty, people um, can react a little bit differently, shall we say, particularly in the more liquid asset classes. Um, so, Chris, let's wrap up with a third story, shall we? So, uh, PEX are reported. Uh, more than one in four properties in 2023 across New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland were paid for in cash. A widening pool of buyers immune to interest rate rises and exerting a greater influence on the housing markets. That was more than 2022 and it's a general, um, been a general rising trend. So what's happening? I guess that's boomers with wealth adding extra properties to their portfolio. Maybe uh, certainly something we've both seen a lot of in recent times has been uh, people from that generation helping their kids onto the housing market to avoid being a renter in a tight rental market. And I guess it's not dissimilar to uh, what we talked about in the first story is as people get wealthier, they generally spend more money on housing. Yeah, I do think this is a bit of the intergenerational wealth getting passed down. I do think there's a a lot of money that have, um, you know, properties that are paid off in suburbs. If you look at some suburbs where it's 50, 60% of the properties are all paid off, right? And so when someone is transacting out of that, they're getting a full cash deposit that they can go and spend on something else. And But also I think there's a lot of people using leverage against their home. So they've released equity in the past and they're using money out of offset accounts to buy properties outright. Um, so it does look like it's a cash buyer, but that cash is coming from debt. Um, a lot of people have been able to get access to leverage when you know multiples of incomes were much higher um, and they're able to not borrow that money again, but that money's just been sitting in offset accounts. I was chatting to a client even just last night who's going to do that exact same thing. You know, We've leveraged up, we released multiple millions of dollars of equity 
um, and now they're going to buy an apartment in Bondi, for example, um, with cash that's actually, but it is a debt. So I think there's a bit of that happening as well. Um, but ultimately, you know, that the strength with the amount of equity within the property market is buyers that aren't affected by interest rates. They're not affected by borrowing capacity. And so even though there's this huge headwind in the market right now where you can only borrow four, four and a half times your income um, and a lot of people don't want to go into debt because interest rates are higher, that doesn't deter a lot of cash buyers out there. And if there's enough cash buyers out there to offset a lot of people who can't sell, you know, because supply is a lot lower and, you know, because people, if they do sell, they can't re-enter the market and they can't upgrade. So they, they just get stuck there. Um, I think that's that's supporting that sort of price growth. But I also think a lot of that cash is coming down. When people are downsizing, they're giving that wealth down to their kids and their grandkids. Um, and so they're going in with huge deposits um, than they were in the past. For sure. And uh, monetary policy has been in the news this week uh, with the Reserve Bank on hold. And interesting, if you get one in four uh, property buyers buying for cash, I guess you'd probably say that, Changes in interest rates have far less impact on the, that part of the market or that cohort. And uh, I think uh, generally it's felt that Australia's variable rate mortgages have impacted households much more swiftly than, say, in the US, which is why uh, markets are pricing for rates to come back down here. But it's just, if you've got one in four people not even needing a mortgage when they buy, uh, maybe not so, so big an impact there. Interesting, you mentioned Bondi Beach. Uh, that was one of the... Uh, postcodes highlighted by uh, PEXA, where there's a, ver- there's a lot, uh, you know, a couple of billion dollars worth of properties around Bondi Beach, uh, bought for cash, Bellevue Hill, another one, Darling Point, Mossman. I think, um, I mean, those um, areas, I guess you get a lot of people wanting a unit, uh, you know, g- great places to buy, you know, um, by the beach, you can have a little two better, you know, north facing type place, lifestyle choices. Interesting to see, though, um, one of the other places that flashed up. Uh, Surface Paradise overtook Broadbeach for the highest aggregate value of cash purchases. That Gold Coast market has been one outlier for a lot of stats recently. Uh, building approvals have generally been woeful around the country, except for the Gold Coast. It seems to be mm. apartment projects there. There's definitely a cycle thing that happens on the Gold Coast because you've got no, there's no restriction on height, really. You can build up to 300 metres. Uh, the market gets really oversupplied and then really undersupplied. And it looks like we're going into um, another building period there. Um, so a lot of cash buyers, a lot of approvals. And, uh, yeah, it's one of the parts of the market where it looks like um, the housing supply might be taking off while the rest of the country not so much. Yeah, and I do obviously this migration story we spoke about, there is a bit of the expats coming back um, who are cashed up. They haven't got any property. They've got money in shares. Their shares are doing quite well. Um, and they are moving back to Australia with a bunch of cash and haven't been able to borrow too much when you are overseas. Just generally speaking, when you go to a you know an expat and you go to a broker in Australia to borrow some money, the amount you can borrow based on your income overseas is is nowhere near what you could do if you were earning that money in Australia. There's, there's sort of haircuts the bank put on them. You know, your rental expenses are usually quite high. And, um, so your servicing is really tight. And so I do think there's a bit of that playing in which one of the articles picked up on um, but you're right, absolutely. I, I was up in Gold Coast last year and there's a proper building boom up there. And I do think it's a different level of stock from what I can see. You know, a lot of the, probably I'd say the, the more medium part of the market and the downsizer market, more of the affordability driven apartments. These are a whole other level. These are whole floor apartments and selling for many millions, a lot of these developments. And so there's, they're, they're big towers, but there's not actually that many apartments in them. So that, that doesn't really create that oversupply problem that we've probably seen in building booms in the past. Is that your sort of take of what's happening in Gold Coast? It's much more of a premium product, um, uh, kind of sky homes versus smaller p- apartments just for investors. You've nailed it. I, I don't think um, your average apartment is stacking up for a developer at the moment, but if you can sell a penthouse or even a block full of penthouse style apartments, that's a whole different equation. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing is that, yes, in some of the premium markets, um, we're seeing very expensive new units being sold. Uh, but just in suburbia, the middle ring properties, well, the the supply is terrible. Uh, Charter Keck Kramer did their latest um, supply report out looking out from 2024 to 2027. And for 
uh, for Sydney, Melbourne. There's a bit of supply still to come this year, but it really tails off. The pipeline is dire. And I think it's, um, I, I think that's why the sentiment is quite bullish, really, for established apartments at the moment, just because nobody's building. It's just not making sense. Now, yes, you could sell a penthouse for $4 million and that would get a developer interested. But generally speaking, people have really stepped away. And as uh, Charter Kate Kramer have highlighted, just so many projects are approved, but they're just not being kicked off because there's no profit and prices need to go up before there is. Yeah, it'd be interesting to sort of track the whole builder story. I mean, they've had it tough right now. They've got a, you know, they'd love to be building, but they just can't get the feasibility to stack up. The buyers haven't got enough borrowing capacity to, to make it work. Um, so even though there's a rental crisis, a housing affordability crisis, they just can't borrow enough and they haven't got enough cash to, to, to pay what the developer needs to make a profit. And it's just not justified um to build it i do think there's a bit of a desire to do home renovation though i think um we've seen a bit of a shift as rates start to plateau and there's confidence that rates are coming back down um and buyers uh, home buyers can't see the way to upgrade they're saying hang on a sec we do need to make changes to our space because you know three bedrooms isn't going to be enough and maybe we do want that pool or that deck and so i think maybe that afford a more affordable renovation is probably coming back on the cards um and so builders are going to have to pivot to, you know, not so much the knockdown and the premium products, but maybe just doing a lot more smaller jobs, um, you know, which is more likely to happen when rates are higher. And so we've definitely seen a bit of an appetite from that, from our clients coming and saying, hey, we want to do a reno, but we want to do it in stages and and maybe we only need 200 grand. We don't need 600 grand to do a full knockdown or, or a full big reno. Um, I don't know. Is that what are you seeing in, in Brisbane, Pete? I mean, I imagine when you drive around, you're still seeing lots of, work happening right there's a lot of people still renovating their properties but i do think they're starting to reduce the you know uh how much people are spending yeah for sure yeah and in fact it's back what you said is actually backed up by the the abs statistics they're lending for major renovations it's way down like i I don't know we had a stimulus package through covid um, but that's wound back but also lending for new construction lending for new housing it's all that near enough record lows so um i I think it's just uh, people are a little bit shy of taking on major projects at the moment because um the the pricing is high and it's uh, it's difficult to make make it make financial sense at the moment and i think it just underscores uh, something you mentioned maybe a week or two ago just that the, there's a widening gap now between the haves and the have-nots and i think um you know, if you look at queensland 30 percent of properties bought for cash last year new south wales 28 Victoria 25 at the same time as we've got massive increases in mortgage stress and arrears are starting to flow through. Uh, the Council of Financial Regulators said they're watching that very closely, but their liaison is showing more people now uh, getting towards hardship. And at the same time as you've got, you know, in Queensland, 30% of properties not even mortgaged when they're bought. So, yeah, there's definitely um, a divergence there. And, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, looks like um, the Reserve Bank's uh, rhetoric uh, this week was a little bit more dovish, I guess. They've they've sort of stopped talking about uh, the potential for rate hikes and they're now just saying, well, nothing's rolled in or out, which is basically more dovish and a more comfortable um, outlook, I guess, that inflation is easy. Yeah, I mean, that was just a, less than an hour ago that came out. We're recording this on Tuesday afternoon. I think it'd be interesting to see how that sort of story comes out over the next couple of days and the notes behind it. Um, but, yeah, I think if that, that does flip again, I do think it's kind of calmed down a little bit. If you go back a month or go, um, there's a bit of an overconfidence. The rate cuts were very close. Um, you know, if you look at some of the RBA rate trackers, those percentages started to drop off and it was unlikely a rate cuts. But... It's still likely to happen this year and the months will just tick over. It's March now. Obviously, Easter's in a couple of weeks uh, and all of a sudden we're going to be in May, June and that's when the supply of properties really dries up. Um, and, you know, I think people will say it's another disappointing um, autumn when there haven't been enough quality listings. I think this conversation of the turnover rate, um, we can't afford to upgrade. Um, we'd love to move, but we don't want to sell. We're just going to do some money and renovate the place. Um, and so they're, they're a buyer that's going to stay in that. They're, they're, you know, a seller and a buyer that's just going to stay in that property. And I think this freezing up of our property market, um, you know, even though borrowing capacity is really tight and unaffordably, uh, affordability metrics are really high as well, uh, as well, that's going to be supported by this 
you know, lack of properties hitting the market over the, you know, I would say over the next decade where people are just stuck in their properties. They love a bigger place or move to a new area, but they just can't make the numbers work. Yeah, and that's why you need a good mortgage broker, I guess, to help you bridge that gap. So uh, on that note, Chris, I think uh, we've, uh, we could probably wrap it up for this week. So three big news stories. Uh, biggest January on record for immigration into Australia. Um, yeah, 125,000 uh, long-term arrivals. It's a lot. And yes, there's some people leaving as well, but that's a huge net figure. Um, and um, yeah, basically a record high for immigration, even now in 2024. Uh, lots of debate uh, in the AFR and Livewire about whether property is the best bet. Um, usually, uh, it's, it's um, circumstances dependent, I suppose, and you need to factor in your preferences and your situation. And then uh, we just did a little uh, section there on where cash buyers are splurging billions for a home. You'll note, Chris, I've not mentioned the FA Cup uh, this week, uh, but I'll uh, I'll be rooting for you guys. You've got a couple of big games for Liverpool coming up, two big home games, I think, and then you've got. Man United again, but I would love to see you guys win the league. Anyone but Arsenal. Yeah, I mean, it was just a distraction, the FA Cup, so I'm sort of glad we're out of that. That's what all good Liverpool fans would say. Um, concentrate on the league. Yeah. <laughs> concentrate on the league. And uh, if you're not a football fan, hopefully Liverpool do win it. So thanks for the chat. Happy Sunday to everyone. Um, send your questions through. If you'd like to get in touch with us, link in the show notes. Um, definitely jump on Pete's blog, one of the best in the country. So look forward to our chat next week, Pete, and uh, take care. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching this video on the RAS Network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing, and so much more.